go to patreon.com slash the Katie Halper show and you'll hear the rest of the interview with our sing into the Friedlander. Hi and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. We are so excited to have two amazing guests live in studio. One of them you have definitely heard before on the Katie Helper Show. She's an organizer, senior organizer, former political director of Credo Mobile, Becky Bond. And you may remember that last time she was on, she was telling us why we had to GOTV. Then we have Zach Exley. Now these two amazing organizers wrote a book called Rules for Revolutionaries, how Big organizing can change everything. But before we talk to them, we are going to play a little uh, piece of an interview that I did, and you can find the rest of it on Patreon, patreon.com slash the Katie Halper Show, where we're keeping some extra bonus content. I want to talk to two comedians to explore the Armageddon we're facing with some comedians. They weren't that funny, and they weren't trying to be funny, but they were smart about it. So I'm going to play that. This is Judah Friedlander. He's a comedian, 30 Rock, American Splendor. Our other guest who we're in conversation with, this man is named Arish Singh. Arish Singh is a Sikh American comedian. I bring up that he's Sikh American. You'll see why. He interrupted a Trump rally or attended a Trump rally and unfurled a sign in Iowa, which is where he's from. I thought we would start just a little bit by laying the groundwork of what happened. So, Arish, would you mind being our, our resident nerdy expert? Um, well, uh, let me stay up front that I'm not an expert. I'm just trying to relative, uh, relative, relevant, Rel- sure. uh, resident <laughs> expert. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the big story is the the collapse of the Midwest as far as having support for Democrats. Um, that Wisconsin and Michigan both were flipped. Uh, these things are are pretty. It's just absurd how um, that broke down and that the the Clinton campaign was not working intensely enough to win over these people. And I mean, it went incredibly red. I, I'm not a pollster. I've just been following the article, as I said, um, but I... You're not a pollster. You just I, crush I, a lot. I, I'm definitely... I'm a comedian. I'm, I'm not in the polling business yet. But I, uh, being from Iowa and just knowing that things were going wrong for like the last week or two, friends and I were like trying to canvas, trying to do calls. It's a very surprising thing to see Iowa go red. And I was kind of you know, even 538 and everything was predicting Iowa was going to go red, but then to see Wisconsin and then also Michigan, and then to just kind of process that they really weren't making a bid, uh, the Clinton campaign, that it didn't register with them that they needed to be out here making the appeal. And I'm not even talking about a working class appeal that I would like to see. That's definitely where my heart is. That's where my politics are. But they weren't even out here doing the groundwork they needed to do. And, you know, I think it was six months ago or so, maybe a little earlier, they outlined the path that Trump had if he wanted to go for this really hardcore white vote, uh, doubling down on that that appeal. I mean, he did get significant amount of votes of people of color. I, I can't downplay that. But there was a particular path that he had. And, you know, it was a long shot path. But like, if that's his only path, and you are not guarding it, everything we're seeing now with all the kind of racism, the kind of violence, I mean, the kind of intimidation is extreme. In Iowa City, uh, where I'm from originally, there was a poster, you know, left at someone's door saying, you know, we don't need any more terrorists, we don't need any more N-words, this is the the family of Sudanese immigrants. That's ridiculous for this city to see that kind of sentiment come out. And you were playing with was not just an electoral outcome, you were playing with a whole lot of societal stability. I mean, we basically put hate on the ballot, and that's something I, up, all up to this point, I've been kind of mocking that like this should not be on there. Like you cannot, you you cannot put these kind of things up for debate. They need to be condemned very widely, and you need to have a strong strong campaign if you're going to go out against it. And and they lost. Um, and my response to this, I don't think it's different from any of us, is that you know you just have to clean house. Basically, these people cannot be allowed to continue as leaders of the Democratic Party all along the line. The extreme rights propaganda is vast, you know, and it's much better. They do a much better job of propaganda than someone, uh, than the people in the center or on the people on the left. You know, I think people on the left, their messages in social media was pretty good. Like if you look at Bernie's social media that was all organic and it was, you know, fan voter oriented, And then if you look at Clinton's social media, it was all pre-programmed corporate and and it wasn't good. And if you look at Trump's use of social media, it was very good. So, you know, the the right and the extreme right, they're they're they were much better when it came down to, you know, between Hillary and Trump. Uh, They they were much better at social media. And, you know, I I thought Trump was probably going to win. I certainly didn't want that. I think it's. a horrifying result. I think most people don't realize how bad things 
can possibly get and how quickly it's likely to happen. To me, it, it wasn't surprising. I mean, when you look at the – on Twitter, you know, I've slammed mainstream media for, I don't know, a few years on this stuff where, I mean, they're in such a bubble. First of all, most of mainstream media is just a big PR firm for whomever is in power. You know, that that's yeah. the way I see it. You know, whether it's the Democrats, whether it's the Republicans – they're in power. And most of the mainstream media is owned by giant corporations, so they're actually going to lean right as opposed to leaning left. So one of the great propagandas that the right has is that all of the mainstream media is super liberal. And I think that's for the most part not true. I think most of it does lean right. And and the liberal is really not to the left, you know. It's it's you know, to me the Republican Party has become very extreme right and most of the Democratic Party is uh, extreme right adjacent. Uh, yeah, totally. It's not really left. Um, and then, you know, the whole thing uh, in Hillary's campaign, which was, you know, one of their slogans they tried to make uh, big was uh, love Trump's hate or love wins. And, you know, uh, Trump was an excellent candidate for hate. Excellent candidate for hate. I think Bernie was a good candidate for love. I think Hillary was kind of neither. So if you look at the election, love never even got to the finals. I think that's true. That's yeah. a great way. Of, I think that's a really yeah. good it, point. Love did not get to the finals. And I think where that's... was Hillary on the Dakota Access Pipeline? Oh and she, my God! She did finally you, releases did you hear her one. Statement? Yeah, I read her statement, which came out first, BS. way too late. Yeah. And the statement was so like corporate neutral, you know. And there's the, the saying. I think it's a Desmond Tutu saying. You know. Um, uh, you know, when you're silent, you're siding with the oppressors. Right. And her statement was just basically saying, you know, let's try to figure out what's Middle going ground, on yeah. so we don't. That was or like read. the biggest finger you could have given to the protesters right. and the people who were supporting. Ignoring it would have been better, honestly. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm honest. saying. It wasn't even a smart move. Right, exactly. It's like, um, yeah, I think one of the things that uh, the, the, the Clintons uh, – where they lose a lot of people is, for example, on the the plane, uh, the the attorney general when Bill Getting Clinton, on Loretta Lynch's plane. Right now, everyone knows. I don't care where you stand ideologically. Everyone knows they were cutting a the deal there. It's so obvious. And then, now let's say this is just a theory, but let's say Trump was caught with the attorney general doing something like that. I don't think he would have given the BS story of, oh, we're just talking about our grandkids, families yeah. and grandkids and stuff like that. He would have been like, no, no, it was nothing. We were just uh, we were just talking. It was, and then move on. Or but, I but, think but, he but, would have even said, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm not that's what I'm saying. He, yeah. Because his thing that was so smart is every single bad thing he did, yeah. he used as a justification for why you should vote for me because he was saying, I right. know the system is right. rigged and right. I cheat it and right. I'm going to help you do that too. Right, exactly. But, but Clinton's saying... First of all, it's bad on a couple levels. It's like you're getting caught cheating, and you should be smarter than that. It's like do you not know there's cameras and pe- people out there? So there's – it's either a dumbness or an arrogance to an think that, yeah. that, that, that you're going to get away with that. And then your excuse of – you know, making up this ridiculous excuse that's insulting to people's intelligence. And for the people that who are against you, it's only going to enrage them and embolden them either more. Now, I just want to quote something that Ben Jealous, who we had last week on. And of course, Ben Jealous, by the way, on this very show, in this very room, exactly a week ago today, predicted how and why Donald Trump would win basically because of unlikely white voters. This is something that Ben Jealous wrote right after the election. Organizing starts now with love. When the dust settles, I suspect we will find that Hillary lost this year for many of the reasons Mitt Romney did four years ago. She overinvested in ads marketing her campaign to Republican moderates, a decidedly shrinking demographic, and underinvested in building her base with people of color, rapidly growing demographics. There are a couple of key differences, of course, between Romney's failure and hers. He would have had to convince people of color to support him. She just had to invest in registering and turning out those who were otherwise unlikely to vote. She lost Florida by approximately 120,000 votes. There are more than 600,000 unregistered blacks in that state. We could have registered all of them for a small fraction of her ad budget. Think about that for a moment. Then consider this. The Democratic Party stopped talking to most working class white men a long time ago. They roared back last night. 
For more than 20 years, most of our party's leaders have supported trade policies that have gutted our cities. We lost Michigan last night. In part, we will likely find because more black men than Dems expected voted for Trump. No longer can we have a political conversation with every demographic of Americans except economically struggling white men outside the cities. No longer can we have an economic agenda that promises more jobs for our country but fails to replace good jobs in the specific cities, counties, and communities where they are lost. Creating a new deal can no longer be empty rhetoric we aspire to. It must become the heart of the reforms we actually deliver. Okay, now the reason I quote Ben Jealous in part is because he got it right. He got, he got it right. Also, he's the former president of the NAACP. I'm not really worried about his not having a, a good race analysis. This person who is an organizer, the former head of the NAACP, is telling us we have to talk to white voters. And I, of course, am white, so I can't say I'm, I'm going to let people of color basically make this argument. And then June and I can respond. But Arish, you as someone who you are a Sikh American... You wear a turban, and you interrupted a Donald Trump rally with a a sign, and you got kicked out. Can you tell us yeah. how someone like you feels the um, the effect of things like this? Like uh, doing that protest in Iowa. Iowa has a long history of tolerance. This is where the Eastern Iowa, in particular, that's where John Brown, you know, sought refuge, where he was able to collaborate with people in Iowa, uh, freeing slaves, right. moving the abolitionists abolitionist movement forward. And that arc of history is there. You know, uh, you were, I was early to uh, allow interracial marriage, gay marriage, think that progressivism is there. And that was part of why I felt comfortable doing that protest. A lot of people were like, how can you go in that room with all these white people and they're, you know, they, they're going to like knock you out. You know, they, someone's going to hit you. I, I'm, I'm from that community. I know how people are. There's definitely a lot of racism, but there's also tolerance. And that was kind of the view I was going in there. And we dropped a sign that said, stop hate. And we were, we were escorted out of there. Part of what we were responding to in particular was there was a, there's a group, I guess they call themselves white nationalists, but they do network with violent extremist skinheads uh, would be an example. They were based in uh, LA and worked with violent skinheads uh, in their recruiting. Anyway, they were robocalling in favor of Trump and you know, ordinary people from Eastern Iowa were, were talking, discussing this, recording these robocalls and being like, you know, we've never seen these kind of politics out here. So when I did that protest, it wasn't just, it wasn't for Sikhs necessarily. It was, it was being in Iowa and being from that culture. I was felt like I was representing for that. Now with uh, Sikhs, one thing that is an issue is uh, a few years ago, there was a, a Sikh temple in Wisconsin that was attacked by a neo-Nazi, a, a total white supremacist. Uh, and he killed six people, left one man in a coma, injured uh, three others. Um, and to see where we're at now, where we have someone who's, I mean, you could say dog whistled. I think in some cases it's even been overt. He's made an appeal to that kind of extremist base. Um, it's stunning. To see the Democratic Party just basically say, we'll use that as a means to advertise ourselves as we're against this kind of thing, rather than like being like, we have to stop it, is just is stunning. The other thing that I that kind of came through the course of the year is that like it became much clearer that the the class sentiment in Iowa was really stronger in a lot of the rural areas and resentment. I think there's also cultural resentment as well. I don't I don't want to just classify as all being a class kind of movement or a class feel, but I think one of the strongest pieces of evidence you do have for that is Obama did win uh, these people in Iowa and other parts of the Midwest in 2008, and they are the ones who went for Trump. Uh, this year. Like if you look down at the breakdown of the map, this is a point Doug Henwood, Connor Kilpatrick, a lot of people have made on the left that, you know, there's definitely racism that was part of this campaign and extreme, ridiculous amounts of racism um, and fringe groups. But uh, it, it's very clear we lost at a, a level of class appeal. And to not have worked that into the center of the message was a terrible failure. I know it, it, it is going to make life much harder for people of color in this country. And and I, I feel a lot of scorn for the for the Democratic Party in that respect. And that was Judah Friedlander, the very great comedian from Thirty Rock, and and also that was Arish Singh, and he will be at the Cleveland Comedy Fest. Now, right now, we have live in studios with us at the Katie Helper Show. Joining us live, we have Zach Exley and Becky Bond. They are organizers extraordinaires, and they also were senior organizers with the Bernie Sanders campaign, and they have a book hot off the presses called Rules for Revolutionaries, How Big Organizing Can Change Everything. And it has blurbs from amazing people like Robert Reich, 
Naomi Klein, Bill McKibben, Nina Turner, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, big movers and shakers. Zach, Becky, welcome. Oh, it's hey. good to be here. Good to have you guys. I wish you guys could see them. They kind of have matching hair color and haircuts. It's a great, it's a great look. Usually glasses, but Zach took them off, so I don't confuse you guys. There we go. Sim yeah. Such a similar. <laughs> right. They're both silver-haired foxes. And um, I thought that I would just start by reading the opening of the preface that Zach wrote. This book has gone to the printer before the 2016 presidential election, so we don't know whether Clinton or Trump is the president. America either just narrowly survived its first brush with actual fascism, or we just learned that, yes, it can happen here. Either way, we believe that the rules in this book provide some of the answers for the struggle ahead. Okay. So, which way did it go, guys? Uh. <laughs> Unfortunately, it did happen here. Right. It did happen here. It could happen here, and it did happen here. Right. Quick question, though, for you guys. Why did you decide to write the book when you did, as opposed to waiting until the results of the election? Well, I mean... I you know, to be honest, you know, we were actually approached by someone who's involved in the social justice movement who said um, back at the end of April, in fact, it was the day of the vote in New York, and said, you know, what you all were able to do with the volunteers on Bernie, it's so important to so many fights. And you know, we need you to, like, to teach these lessons um, to uh, these, social, these groups, small groups in these social justice movements um, who, are, um, who need to have more volunteers and need to do more with less in some real life or death struggles. And so can you put together these lessons from the Bernie campaign that can help win fracking fights and can help you know, force police forces to stop killing black people without accountability? And so we just thought, you know, it's true. We learned a lot on the campaign. And usually what happens after a campaign is staff become high-priced consultants and, um, and only big organizations can hire them to tell them about the secret sauce for the campaign. And we thought, well, what if we wrote a book and that was, you know, not stories from the inside of the campaign, but we're really organizing lessons. Um, and w we thought we would need it right after the election because we thought we'd need to be holding a President Clinton accountable, we hoped, um, for the promises that she made on the campaign trail. And, you know, we felt very proud that the Bernie Sanders campaign really moved Clinton on some issues that we care about deeply, right? Um, everything from opposing the TPP to supporting free public college. And so, um, and so we wanted to um, make sure that she followed through on those promises, and we thought that we'd uh, need an army of volunteers who were using some of these rules and maybe writing some of their own to be able to do that. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think it's probably more useful to have it now, even though we didn't know who's going to be president. Like, I'm glad we have this book now, as opposed to having waited until we knew. We can kind of hit the ground running. Well, I mean, it's this, I think it's the same struggle, you know, either way, actually. And somebody the other day was saying, you know, well, you know, we, uh, we lived through Nixon, we lived through Reagan, we lived through Bush, but actually millions of people did not live through them. And it, but it wasn't just those Republicans. It was, you know, when, when we had Democrats in office, uh, people were also dying, right? Mass incarceration was, Democrats were largely responsible for that. And we could go on and on, you know, talking about how, how both the Democratic establishment and the Republican establishment were really, um, you know, e basically everybody e that falls under either one of those labels was either corrupt or complicit with the corruption. And all sort of were united around this ideology of uh, decline that we just, you know, there's nothing we can do. We, our society is gradually unraveling and well, that's just what the 21st century has in store for our country. And, uh, you know, they had two slightly different uh, flavors of how they thought about that. The Republicans said, let's get rid of all the regulations, let's get rid of the government, and then the economy will take care of itself and our society will take care of itself. Democrats said, oh, you need to tweak the regulations just a little, just get them just right, and then everything will take care of itself. And, it's, you know, meanwhile, Americans have been suffering. And for a while, it was just the very poor and people of color, black people, Latinos, Native Americans, immigrants. And eventually, uh, it became a bigger and bigger share of our society to the point where um, we're in the situation where we are today. So, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, woke up the day after the election. I mean, I know a lot of people, you know, in my circles woke up the day after the election saying, oh, this is crazy. This is terrible. It's like, where have you been? You know, and we have, we have two, two and a half million people in prison. Uh, vast majority of them black and Latino, that's been true for decades. So where have you been? So this book, uh, I think we were writing it, uh, you know, for either scenario, right? And, uh, and I think the, the struggle is going to be just as urgent under either scenario because whether Trump happened this year 
or in 2020 or somebody like Trump or somebody worse than Trump. It's, you know, we've been going in this direction for a long time. So we're going to go through um, actual stuff in the book, but I just want to ask you some questions. And, and I had an epiphany. I'm not a religious person, but the one Jewish holiday my family does celebrate is Passover because, of course, it's a story of liberation. And um, and you guys can laugh into the mic. I'm always telling people this on the show. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. a good thing. Comedy. You, don't, you, don't you gotta have to, laugh. No, no. No, then I say yes. that and people think I'm trying to – they're visually – visibly laughing, but they're polite. They don't want to make noise. Right, but right. you got to make big organizing noise when you're doing yeah. this. Just like it makes, changes everything, right? <laughs> big laughter changes everything. On Passover, there are these four questions, right? Passover is all about freedom. And of course, for me, it's not, you got to apply it to everyone. This is not a, a, a Jewish chauvinist thing at all, obviously. It's back spirituals, you know, we're based on the story. And right, because the Old Testament is, a, is all, all the people who follow that religion. You're welcome, evangelicals who hate me. Okay, <laughs> so, um, so on Passover, you have these four questions that the youngest kid at the table asks. And Passover, if you don't know what it is, it's like a Jewish Easter. Listeners out there, and the questions are, how is this night different from other, all other nights? I wanted to do the four questions for this election. So the first one is, how is this election different from all other elections, i.e., why and how did Trump win? I think, I mean, I think Trump won. It was basically sucker punch to a weak and feeble establishment. Okay. Well, I agree with that. I mean, it was, I would say it was a resounding defeat of Clintonism and neoliberalism. Great. Right. So neoliberalism, Clintonianism. Now, here's another question. Who is our Moses? In other words, one person who we should listen to, someone who got it right, someone who's getting it right. Well, that's a beautiful thing about the big organizing is we, ne we, don't, we never have just one person. Right. And even when it was- Not a, me, us. It, yes, not me, us. Yeah. You know, And um, you know, we dedicated our book to the volunteers who are leading the political revolution because for us, that's really where it's at. And the, um, the hundreds of thousands of people across this country that did so much to try to elect Bernie president, but they're also doing all these things in their daily life, right? To fix America and make things better, and you know we can um, name some of them, you know, on the air. People like Deborah Mays in California, people like um, Deron Black in Kansas City, people like Deborah Sagner here in New York City. A lot of Deborahs. Yeah, I know. It's cool. <laughs> I'm sure you know. I'm going to the Old Testament, yes, right? Yes, I'm going, again. I'm going to back that. But I also <laughs> think we should name a few people because we do like to have people that can voice things that we maybe can't voice. And I, I just want to call out Nina Turner, oh, um, who's her. such an amazing um, and righteous leader you know, for our movement. Lucy Flores, we were so honored that both Nina Turner and Lucy Flores actually read our book and uh, and wrote endorsements and in, in, in for it and, and said that this is an important thing for people to read. And since they were so important to the Bernie movement, um, you know, we were really happy to see that leaders like Naomi Klein and, and, and Bill McKibben um, that are that are that are inspiring, you know, us. Um, uh, but, you know, you may have some Zach. I probably left some people out, but I mean, I know I did, but that's. the. Well, beauty. yeah, we, we left out about, you know, 100,000 <laughs> right. people. Yeah, that's but right. <laughs> but it is. Uh, and but they really do the volunteers that that led uh you know Bernie's campaign and that led in the Clinton campaign right they uh and that led in all the movements and organizations that were participating in this whole uh movement i mean in this whole election they there's so they really saw what happened and what didn't happen and what needed to happen and there's a lot of knowledge out there and um and they're also we i mean actually we 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 really need to figure out a way to elevate those voices because a lot of the pros you know who saw what happened and have a critique of it they're not actually speaking up because you know they've got friends that participate you know that, that helped run the Clinton campaign and they don't want to hurt their feelings and you know uh and but but we really need to and it's not about you know Wednesday morning quarterbacking you know after the Tuesday election it's uh it, you know th this is huge stakes here and we we need to learn from this and everybody who's involved in organizing whether it's inside the Democratic Party or outside we got to figure this out Awesome. And any, just in terms of like, there's so many hot takes going around, right? So any anal analysis that you found really on the nose, really like nailed it? Well, I think like you said, Ben Jealous, right. uh, was, that was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Ben, ben Jealous. Becky, do you have someone? If, well, I mean, I've got to say Katie Alper. I mean, if you follow yes. her on Twitter, oh, yes. I mean, some amazing, <laughs> some amazing stuff. No, we, we really, it, it's heartened us, you know, oh, the stuff you. that we've seen you say. Well, you know what? I, I was saying, if I can just be therapy for the people who are out there doing organizing and the pavement pounding stuff, I'm fine with that. Yeah, Ben Jealous was on the show last week, and he, he nailed it. Then he wrote a great takeaway about it and said, um, this is kind of a scary statistic, uh, she lost by approximately 120,000 votes uh, in Florida, and there are more than 600,000 unregistered blacks in that state. 
and oh, a lot of right yeah. And, yeah and a lot of that money went into ads mm -hmm. so um that's that's my example well and and the the message wasn't there the vision wasn't there right. to you know draw people out to vote you know so you you know i think you can go out there and and register you know accost people at the supermarket and register them all you want but you do have to get them to the polls and that that requires uh, a vision and a message right yeah and i think well you know one of the things that we found in you know, um, and, and I'm really proud of um, of the Bernie supporters who even, you know, when they didn't like it, they went out and voted for Clinton because it was important. And um, and uh, lots of them have stories, you know, about that. But, you know, I mean, essentially we were, you know, voting for something that was pitched as a third term of Obama, you know, plus extra war. And, you know, for a lot of people that just, you know, was not enough <laughs> to get them to participate. Right. right. Yeah. Without the appeal. I, yeah, I mean, I, lo love whatever you think about Obama, he's a charming, very appealing person, I think. Yeah, I mean, yep. he he ran. I mean, the thing is, we, you know, you got what you got to remember about Obama is he ran on in two thousand eight, and again in twelve, he ran on this soaring rhetoric of hope and change, right? And he turned out to be, uh, you know, uh, I, he, we, you know, I mean, you know, he's a great guy, but uh, <laughs> but you know, there wasn't, you know, all that big change, and you know, and and I think. Yes, you know, the Republicans were standing right, in the way, but, right. but I really think at the end of the day, you know, unfortunately, I still don't understand it because, you know, I, I know, you know, I've read enough and heard it enough about Obama and heard enough stuff that he said. I don't know if anybody understands this about, you know, why didn't he try to mobilize his movement after the 2008 election? Why didn't he, you know, he, he had the Dem Democrats in the House and Senate. Why didn't he call on the American people to move the Democrats on health care, for example? Why didn't he say, and, and this is applicable to, to Hillary's uh, election, I mean, loss, because, you know, why, why didn't he say, hey, everybody, look, there's a really simple way we could solve this problem? Because he knew about this way. You know, let's just have, let's just, we, got, we have a health care system. It's got it's huge. It's bigger than any health care system in the world. And why don't we just open it up and let everybody have access to it if they want, right? And let the insurance, the private insurance companies, you know, fend for themselves in a truly free market. Why didn't he say that? Uh, it wasn't a new idea, right? Howard Dean had run on that. Uh, Bernie ran on that. There was a lot of, you know, mainstream policy people that were into that. Why did he feel like he had to make the same weird deal with the insurance companies, you know, that, that Hillary had tried to do back in 92, especially considering that they torpedoed it? Why, why, why Obama? And why, uh, why, why, yeah, but yeah. he, you know, but he was able to, you know, he, he won with people thinking there was going to be a lot more of that, more, you know, a lot real hope and change. I think a lot of people were expecting, you know, real transformation. And then in 12, you're right, he was just so damn charming and uh, and was able to keep people excited. And he was running against Mitt Romney, you know, like, you know, who also, you know, who actually invented Obamacare. Right. You know, and so it wasn't like Romney had a strong case, you know, ah, this terrible Obamacare thing. So I don't know. And then but the problem was, yeah, Hillary Clinton was you know without the soaring rhetoric, but with the same right. neoliberal black yeah, I mean, agenda. I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't even think and slightly that, less hawkish. I, I mean, yeah. slightly more hawkish. More yeah, hawkish. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I don't think, I don't think you know we even have to talk about Clinton's appeal or not, or her charm or her rhetoric. And I think it's you know when you think about it, I mean, you would you call Bernie a natural politician? No, but he's the you know? antithesis of it, which has its own charm. Well, I know this isn't you know, really what we yeah, want to be I mean, talking about, I mean, but, I, but here's the thing: talk, is, yeah. here's the thing that we really learned is that when you when you tell the truth to the voters, they really respond to that. And just like how many college campuses was I on where I asked some seven, like 18 year old you know Bernie, like college students for Bernie member who was doing all the stuff is just like well wh why Bernie you know what I mean and it was like well he's been saying the same thing for 30 years um so I really believe him and they watched and then these kids they made these videos you know where they looped together all the the clips of yeah. Bernie being yeah. righteous you know <laughs> and and doing the right thing when it was hard and you know the other thing that Bernie did that Clinton you know somehow just couldn't do is just go ahead and just just take the big the big position on all the issues, right? Not just say, okay, we're going to focus on these three messages because it really hits our swing voters that we really need. You know, he was for stopping the deportations and free public college. Um, he was for, you know, um, uh, um, breaking up the banks and not like a 32-point plan that would, you know, just do a few of these things. And you know, the American people, you know, they get it. I mean, they lost their homes and the bankers got their got their bonuses, you know, their kids, you know, can't go to college, right? They, or if they are, they, they have not even finished paying off their student loans when their kids start racking up student loans. And so, you know, for them to participate, you know, like, it's hard, how can you blame them when you have politicians that are promising to continue the same uh, system or say, if you want something more, they call you naive, 
you know what I mean, or just, you know, wanting free stuff. And I think the Democrats treated the base like they were takers, you know, and that's Paul Ryan's line, right? Right. You know, it shouldn't be the Democrats. Right, with with the Democrats like these, who needs Paul Ryan? <laughs> Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, just talking about people losing their homes made me think of something that there, you know, way more people, way more families, you know, lost their homes uh, in the 2008 debacle than people who voted for Hillary Clinton in the primaries or voted for Trump or Bernie in the primaries. Wow. I mean, it was I forget the exact number, but it's something like 10 or 15 million families lost their homes. And. That's cr- you know so think about that right and then you know that, that that and and we met them on the road I mean we so many people who stood up at the beginning of our organizing meetings and told why they were for Bernie talked about the home that they lost and they you know and they knowing that that you know we the people were while the bank was taking away that home we were like shoveling trillions of dollars into the coffers of those very same banks and that just made people so incredibly angry. And every, any, in case anyone just tuned in, we're talking to uh, Becky Bond and Zach Exley, authors of Rules for Revolutionaries, How Big Organizing Can Change Everything. And they are former senior organizers with the Bernie Sanders campaign. And they decided to uh, share their tips, not only their tips, but the, everything that they learned from all the organizers and volunteers that they worked with. Um, so we're on to uh, the, the good, like the people who had great takeaways and great messages or the people who did the pavement pounding work. Next, I want to ask about, um, you know, the question about why we recline on tonight. Now, you don't have to answer this this way, but I want to know who needs to not just recline, but who needs to resign. So who are the people? And you don't have to name names. You can say the hot takes that you find most destructive because what I'm seeing is a lot of – um, how do I say this diplomatically? Not a lot of introspection coming from for, from current um, DNC officials and coming from former Clinton staffers. I'm seeing a lot of creative um, blaming, people that I had no idea had anything to do with this. I'm seeing people blaming people who just statistically didn't do what they're saying, like third-party people. I'm seeing Rachel Maddow blame third-party people, and she's a Rhodes Scholar. That means, Rachel, <laughs> you're not actually mistaken because you're a Rhodes Scholar. You have a big staff. <laughs> you're bending the truth, and we saw you do that with NAFTA also, which that was a Shonda. Um, so what are the hot takes that, that you see that are most destructive and, and then, yeah, and that you wish you could you, – you just want – every time I – want, I want to make it so that people know every time they hear X, this person is not telling the truth or their mistake. The things that I'm – I mean, there's a, probably two or three things that are really bugging me. One is when people say we need to wait and see what Trump's going to do, and I think we have to take Trump at his word in the campaign mm, that he's going to yeah. do all the, the terrible stuff that he said. And uh, and people talked about how we should work with Trump on issues you know where we align, and, and I think that's just patently false because there just are no issues – you know, with Trump where we uh, align because, you know, Trump is a um, – he's not a populist, right? He's not a, he's not a right-wing populist. He's a right-winger who appropriated populism, you know, in order to, you know, um, pull in some voters to, to vote – you know, think they're they think they're voting for their interests, but they're really voting against their interests because he's using racism and this anti this is xenophobia, you know, to divide to divide you know working class uh, blacks, working class Latinos, and, and, and working class whites. Um, the other thing is, you know, I think some people are saying I've I've heard some people say, you know, what we did everything we could, nobody could have beaten Trump, and I, I think that's if we think that's true, then we might as well like you know give up and Pack go, up, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, learn to be a yoga instructor or something yeah. because you know like <laughs> or switch teams and become militia members. Well. <laughs> I mean, you know, because it's just like we can't think right. that, right? Because, first of all, I truly believe we absolutely should have and could have beaten Trump if we'd taken a, a different approach to the election, which was, you know, less about sort of out of touch, you know, elites from the Democratic Party, you know, running the campaign that appealed to them, you know, with the stars that appealed to them, you know, uh, overly reliant on, on technology and not getting enough people involved because if they'd had people, enough people on the ground, you know, in these states where they, where they, where they lost narrowly, you know, they would have been hearing, I mean, Somehow, even Debbie Dingell, the congresswoman from Ann Arbor, you know, I mean, it's pretty amazing that she published something saying, I tried to tell the Clinton campaign we were going to lose. We were losing these voters. And somehow there was just no feedback loop to the people. And I think, you know, when you work in politics, it's really a recession proof industry. Right. And so um, and so they don't they don't have the same ups and downs. You know, and, and I just think a lot of people involved in running these campaigns just didn't have a real visceral sense of how much people were hurting. And if they had, I just can't imagine they would have run the same campaign that they did. And I, and I, and I can't imagine that they would have lost. They should have hired you guys. The Clinton <laughs> campaign should have hired you guys. Would you have done it if they had reached out? 
Well, you after know, obviously after Bernie lost the primary. Well, you know, I mean, like all like so many of the volunteers that you know that put it put it all on the line for Bernie. Like we share Bernie's political analysis, right? And if a, if the if the Clinton campaign had run on Bernie's platform, and there was a um, you know, and 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 there's an authentic conversion, you know, what I mean, from some of her stands in the past, you know, to say like, hey, look, this is it, you know what I mean? I'm gonna you know Hillary Clinton unleashed, you know what I mean, and on that well, platform, then but, but you know, but but sadly, it doesn't. I mean, you know. It doesn't. It wouldn't have even have needed to be uh, a genuine conversion, you know. I right. Mean, that's Trump, what I'm asking. Like, what Trump were the had, things that? Because yeah. you guys are saying that Hillary, you two former Bernie Sanders people, are basically saying Hillary, who you don't obviously we have major problems with, but you're saying her campaign could have won, could have defeated Trump, right? Well, I mean, of course. Yes. I mean, well, that's and, what, and that's so what they would have told you, you know, five days ago, right? I mean, no, I think right, I think but, that what what we learned from Trump, right? I mean, Trump Trump did not have a genuine conversion. Uh, on a whole range of issues, right? He just popped up one day and said, "Hey, I'm I'm with you guys on everything," you know. And although every... xenophobia, I think may oh, yeah. ma- I think oh, yeah. xenophobia and, <laughs> and isolationism may be real, and that's one area. And I'm not being touched. Like he's an awful person, but I think maybe sometimes you know, there's the the trade stuff aligns for the totally wrong reasons, right? That's yeah. why everyone anyway. But but on stuff like uh, abortion, right. uh, gay marriage, you know, there was a whole bunch of issues where. He was just like, hey, yeah, I'm with you guys, you know. Even and, though he's not. I mean, yeah, I whatever. Yeah, but yeah. but that doesn't mean that I'm scared. I'm more scared of Mike Pence personally than I well, am yeah. him. But that's yeah. another another but, issue. No, but, but my, my point is, is that pe- the people, they just like they want to know that, you know, they, they're suffering and they just, you know, if, if they don't want to vote for Donald Trump. I mean, is you know, the, 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 there's so many the counties that we lost in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, a whole lot of the counties that, that, that we needed, went, they went for, uh, for, for Obama in 2008, and they went for Trump in 2016, right? We, if, 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 uh, if Clinton had really just said, I hear you, I get it, we've screwed up, you know, we haven't, you know, we need to try harder, we, could, we really, but, but instead they kind of brashly, ignored those concerns mm-hmm. and it seemed like they thought that there was so little chance of Trump winning that uh that they could just kind of you know really not concede anything um you know uh, they didn't have to concede anything right and and it was really a matter of you know she spent all of her not all uh, but she spent like half of her time with wealthy donors and and a couple times we even got these tapes from these conversations that she was having with them and where she was mocking the idea of any kind of significant change, right, and, and any kind of you know um, non incremental change, and and so you know I think they that she felt like oh, I can keep all my options open here. I don't have to concede on anything. Like what we were hearing earlier about her statement, um, you know, uh, on the pipeline, and oh, uh, so you know, so I think that that and, and it's interesting because I remember. Um, few months ago, I posted uh, something on Facebook where I was like, Donald Trump has no chance of winning. It's time for the whole progressive movement to come out and push Hillary as far to the left, not to the left even, but just towards what people really need, you know, on trade, on economics, on jobs. This is our chance. If we don't do it now, you know, she's going to win this mandate without that. But And I actually, so I was obviously wrong about Trump not having a chance. But uh, I mean, but uh, but it would. But actually, if we had if the progressive movement had pushed her on those issues and if she had taken if she had come out and said, OK, I hear you, she would have had a shot. with right. some of those voters. Great example. TPP. I always bring yeah. it up yeah. when people say, oh, it's I mean, one of the things coming out now is we pushed her too hard to the left. Impossible, first of all. But also he ran you, to the left. He ran to the on, left on her, TPP on, on TPP. Yeah. yeah. So, you, I mean, this is what kills me. It's like we were I see the people who would refuse to. Her her inner circle and all the people who blindly supported her were actually her enablers, and I think like helped ha- what happened happen. You don't have to say that; I'll say that. But um, I I think that one thing I just want to bring up about the class stuff is that I think that m- people may be saying that stuff. What I really hear is more that people are frustrated; they feel like certain things have been neglected with with class stuff, and the, and all the people I know who talk about this or write about this realize that race is there. It's just that it's that identity politics, you can't include everything in identity politics but class, right? Identity politics, which is like a kind of academic term, but look, we need to talk about all these things, right? And we need to appeal to people on all levels. And the reason I I thought that it was so important to talk to Arash, who is the the comedian who I played at the beginning, um, 
is because what he said is that he has scorn for the Democrats for not addressing class issues because he's someone who walks down the street and wears a turban and he's someone who's at risk, right? And he's someone who feels the the outcome of this increased hate, hate based, I mean, the increases in hate crimes, right? Or increases, he said that he gets called, people yell terrorists at him in ways that they didn't. And this has been since Trump entered the race. And his thing is like, and this is what I'm trying to say. I have a class analysis that, that I'm very intersectional, right? I think class and race overlap. I don't, I would rather we like take potential Trump supporters who are maybe susceptible to racism. And this is what I think Bernie did. Like we actually reach out to them and say, look, this is why you don't blame these people. Blame the banks. It's very simple to me. You have angry people. You can tell them they want to blame someone. You have Trump saying blame Muslims, blame Mexicans, right? Then you have Bernie, who was saying blame corporations, blame the like the billionaires, right? And then people are so out of touch. I bring this up a lot, but Paul Krugman criticizing Bernie for uh, being appealing to the very people we need not to be the racist xenophobes is so out of touch. It's like a purity. Like, no, we can't even be God. God forbid, like that these people are receptive to Bernie Sanders. No, we don't want them them to be. We want a vacuum there where it's only Donald Trump or nothing, right? So. The important thing, I think, is that you could hate poor white working class people. I don't. Right. I actually think that like I have not to sound precious, but I I actually have compassion for lots of people. But even if you hate them, if you care about people of color, you can't afford demographically to not speak to these people because the racists will win. Well, here's the thing about big organizing, and this is why we really wanted to sell this story in our book. Rules for revolutionaries, how uh, big organizing can change everything, by the way. (laughs) Thank you. you. And was was that, you know, you know, we wouldn't have to pick and choose who we talk to if we just talk to everybody. Right. And one of the great and and the thing is, is that if you actually say, well, you know, we have a plan for government to actually solve your problems, not just give you a tax credit at some point in the year that's actually not going to fix anything or a 10 point plan that may or may not lead to something you know, we're actually going to solve your problems, then, you know, and, and then you can get a lot of people to work on your campaign and then you can talk to everybody and turn everybody out. You don't have to pick, right? And so, you know, in the Bernie campaign, you know, early on in the primaries, we realized we had so many people making phone calls from California and Texas and other places that in advance of the Nevada caucus, we actually had enough people. We could just call every number in Nevada, like every day. And the reason why you call them before the election is to find out, well, you know, are you going to vote for Bernie? Are you going to vote for Clinton? Or are you undecided? And we can have out-of-state volunteers, you know, not just call the people we think might vote for Bernie, but like call the Republicans, call the independents. And then and then you just know who's with you. And if they're with you, you ask them to volunteer and they join you. If they're against you, you just let them go. You know, and you don't talk to them again. And if they're undecided, then you can have your state staff go out and make the case, give them Bernie's message and help to bring them over to our side. And you don't have to pick. I'm going to really concentrate on African-Americans or I'm really going to concentrate on, you know, the Latino working class. or I'm really going to concentrate on the white working class. And to be honest, like, you know, we could have a huge movement and win and, and win back the House and the Senate if we could just bring black working class, Latino working class, and white working class voters together and a unified movement, you know, that understands that race needs to be a part of the core message to everyone and that we can't solve, you know, income inequality without dealing with um, structural racism. And, you know, we can just bring people together because what people want is for government to solve their problems. And it, well, the thing that scares me, one of the things that scares me the most about Trump is that you know, he's not going to do all the stuff he said. Like, he's not going to build the factories and give people jobs. And when they start to get angry about that, he's going to be like, here's some red meat. Let's, today we're going to deport, you know what I mean, these people and put it on television, put the ice buses, you know what I mean, on television. And so he's going to have to hurt people in order to um, rev up his most adamant base and distract them for right. the fact that he's not delivering on his economic pros- promises. I-, I think we have to be ready for that. Reggie, I see you shaking your head passionately. Do you want to? No, I, I I agree with a lot of the things that have been said, and and I've said this in other programs before. I mean, uh, Hillary Clinton was more interested in getting the approval of um, Henry Kissinger than rather yes, than making right. coalition with Black Lives Matter right. or with the Dreamers. And and really, if if it's the funny thing is is that I, I saw the Thirteenth a couple of weeks ago, and I think it was a really good film. And really, if I would. If Hillary Clinton mm. would have listened and looked at David ri- DuVernay's a- uh, documentary, DuVernay, right? um, you know, and, and, and Ava was really giving a pass to 
to the Clintons, and, and, and no doubt, and and really, she should have learned from that, you know, and 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 how much leeway that someone like her was giving, and just that little moment, that concession, that sort of kind of concession speech that she gave, if she gave a little bit more humility, yeah, totally. during during the, her campaign, she might. Yeah. It might have yeah. been a different situation. Right. Yeah. Right. So well, and all, you know, and also, I mean, when we were before the before the election, we were talking about what, what might we write, you know, depending on the outcome. And we thought if it was really close, but you know, we were thinking Hillary would win. We, you know, we thought one of the articles we might have to write is don't, you know, stop blaming black people. You know, stop blaming black voters who didn't turn out in overwhelming numbers. Yeah, I mean, and that's in, why it's so close. In fact, Rashad and, Robinson yeah. did write that piece, right. and everybody should read it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The brilliant yeah, no, I know, yeah. yeah. If we had lost a different few states, that's, right. that is what people would be saying right now. So she, you know, what, what was her great message to African-American voters? What was her great message to Latino voters, right? I don't know if, I don't, I don't Abuela. know. Abuela. Uh, abuela for yeah, the Latino yeah. voters. Well, there were a lot of people in Florida with not my abuela. Stickers. I know it yeah. did not land very well. Yeah. Well, and, and and it's also just about what do they do? I mean, I, I asked myself after the election, I'm like, why didn't anybody fix the water lines in Flint? Yeah. Why why didn't that get fixed? Yeah. You know what I mean? Why it's just like why didn't the Army Corps of Engineers digging those pipes up? You know what I mean? And create some jobs and like I mean we spend so much money on stupid so stuff. How do we, I just want to <clears throat> yes. I want to make sure that people know though what you guys what are what can we do right now? Okay, my fourth question was organizations, things that people can join, support, do. Like when you say we have to be ready, because as you said, when Trump can't. Uh, Sa you know, can't satisfy people with economic stuff, he's going to go even farther to the xenophobic right, right? So what do we do? Like, I had this idea, which Arish told me wasn't going to work, because people would be offended. I get it. Religion is a sensitive thing. So I'm trying to think of a better way to do it. But I was like, what if we all wear hijabs? Like, if we all somehow have the, like, share the burden, right, to make it that much harder to round people up. Now, hijab won't work, because I get it. People are religious and don't necessarily want people to wear them if they're not. But something like that, I mean, how do we do this so that, that the vulnerable populations aren't the only ones bearing the burden? Well, you, I don't even know if that's yeah. possible. But yeah, Well, you know, I mean, there, I think that there's a lot of great groups in every community uh, that are, you know, that, that work with uh, immigrants, that work with undocumented immigrants, that work with refugees. And, uh, you know, there, there's uh, huge numbers of, of refugees being, you know, resettled in virtually every city in America. Uh, and 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 they really need help. You know, I've I've uh, I've worked with organizations like that in some cities where I've lived, and um, that, that I think you know if they got an overwhelming you know surge of volunteers coming in wanting to get involved, uh, I think that would be amazing. Yeah, and, and I mean I'll I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll offer a few groups that are doing great work on the ground. <clears throat> There's a group called Mihente that is um, that is leading the movement. Not one more deportation. Um, uh, protecting folks from, from deportation. Color of Change has been doing amazing work to um, elect uh, district attorneys and hold them accountable um, to ensure that when, when, when police officers kill black people that they're prosecuted. Um, I think that the um, uh, there's a group that Zach and some uh, volunteers from the Bernie campaign have started, which is called Brand New Congress, and that's going to try and run hundreds of candidates in 2018 to, to throw the bums out. But I'd, I'd also say, you know, um, look for, you know, if, if there's not, you know, sort of the remnants of some of the Bernie organizing where you live, and, and now it's just it's just justice organizing, right? Um, you know, you just need to get together. It might just be 10 people. It might be 100 people. Get people together where you live. Find a problem that you need to solve, whether it's your city needs to become a sanctuary city, you know what I mean? Or, you know, I, I bet there's going to be Black Lives Matter protests coming up on um, on um, Black Friday, perhaps this year again, you know what I mean? And they need solidarity and um, uh, and people to you know to um, to defend them against attack from their own community. Um, but find out, set a goal for yourself, and come together. And you know, our book has 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 a lot of practical, you know what I mean, information in it about how to hold an effective meeting that gets people to work, uh, about how to organize. Um, tips for how to best organize other people, how to use consumer software that costs no money um, to run your um, volunteer organization. So really, it's just like, don't wait for an organization to come up with a smart plan. We might need you to do it. Right. I like it. My plan, by the way, we got to make civil disobedience sexy. Because it is. Yeah. It is. It's it's so cool. That's what like action movies should be about. It's so awesome when people are able to stand there, especially when they're bigger. Then the other person, I mean, that takes a lot of discipline. I think it's butch. I think it's hot. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it. I'm going to start making action movies. I'm not going to be the person in it because I don't look impressive uh, not not attacking someone because I couldn't. But anyway, that's what we got to do. Um, 
and all the things that you guys are saying. This is, of well, course— and, a- and I would say civil disobedience to stop the unconstitutional things uh, that Trump has right, promised right. he's going to do. Center for Constitutional think, Rights, another yeah, great I, organization yeah. that yes. we can we can look yeah. to maybe. But um, talking uh, to Becky Bond, Zach Exley, we're so happy that you guys came in. Uh, Rules for Revolutionaries is their book. You definitely want to get it. How Big Organizing Can Change Everything— and um, we will see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to the Katie Halper Show. And, um, yeah, you guys are great. And follow and go to big – what's the website? Um, Rules, Rules for, Revolu- for Revolutionaries.org. Dot org, yeah. Thank you so much. Hi. Go to patreon.com slash the Katie Halper Show, and you'll hear the rest of the interview with Arish Singh and Judah Friedlander. 